Great. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm John Vandermosten, Senior Biotech Analyst at Zacks, and welcome our viewers to the conversation with ElectroCore CEO, Dan Goldberger. Uh, Dan and I have known each other for many years uh, in some of his previous executive roles, and we at Zacks have covered uh, ElectroCore for about a year now. It's one of our favorite names because it's generating revenues and growing them at a rapid pace. We see a lot of opportunities that will drive future growth already in play. And these include strong and improving relationships with the Veterans Administration in the United States and the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. Other opportunities in the US include further penetration to the commercial payers. Uh, and, and ElectroCore actually already has a, an impressive roster of familiar names there that uh, our viewers would, would, would recognize. Um, the largest near-term opportunity in our opinion is the international partnerships that the company has forged over the last year. And they provide access to Europe, Australia, Canada, Asia, and the Middle East. Not only does the company's technology have a wide variety of users, but GammaCore is being investigated in over 10 new indications beyond headache. So we're here today to hear from ElectroCore. So I'll let Dan introduce himself and then get on with the questions. Dan, can you give us some background and, and let us know how you came to lead ElectroCore? John, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you all for making time to listen to us. We greatly appreciate the uh, support and the in-depth research that, uh, that Zach's provides. So uh, really great to be here. Uh, my name is Dan Goldberger. I've been the CEO of, uh, of ElectroCore uh, since October of 2019. Uh, personally, I'm trained as an engineer. I have degrees in optics and mechanical engineering from MIT and Stanford. I uh, spent my early career in uh, product development and moved from there into operations and from there into sales and uh, general management. I've been in the uh, CEO role in uh, small, medium-sized medical technology businesses uh, for the last 20 years or so, um, and uh, thrilled to have joined ElectroCore, where we are commercializing our proprietary technology for non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. Right now we're focused on headache, uh, but as we go through the talk, you'll see this is really a, a platform technology with, with broad ranging indications and implications for uh, the treatment of a variety of chronic medical conditions. Great, Dan. Well, I wanna start out with some basic questions because maybe not all the viewers are familiar with, with uh, ElectroCore and GammaCore, um, but what exactly is GammaCore? What is it used for and where did the technology come from? Okay, um, so this is a, a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator. Um, the vagus nerve is a, is a very important part of the nervous system in the human body. It's been studied for a very long time uh, in particular, vagus nerve stimulation, vagus nerve stimulators have been available for, I think, more than 25 years now, uh, initially as implantable devices. We don't make them, but other companies have a substantial business in implanted vagus nerve stimulators. You know, so think of a pacemaker, but instead applied uh, to the vagus nerve. And those are on label for treatment of severe epilepsy and severe depression. The founders of this company of ElectroCore were initially looking for less invasive percutaneous ways to do the same thing as the implanted vagus nerve stimulators. And in the course of that development, they discovered that uh, they could deliver the necessary energy transdermally. So in a completely non-invasive fashion. And in the course of doing the initial clinical trials uh, on inflammation and respiratory issues and epilepsy, uh, the patient participating in the clinical trials kept coming back and saying, hey, my headache went away. And so the company sort of pivoted to focus on pain and specifically headache. And so today, as I mentioned, this is our portable device. It has two electrodes on the business end. And when you power it up, it delivers a two minute dose of electrical energy to specifically stimulate the vagus nerve, which we access here along the carotid artery. And the FDA has cleared this device for prevention and treatment of cluster headache in adults and for prevention and treatment of migraine headaches in adults and most recently in adolescents. So 
headache is a very large total addressable market. Unfortunately, it's a, a chronic condition. When we talk about acute treatment of headache, uh, we talk about, I feel like I have a headache coming on. I take this device out of my pocket or my purse. It's a personal use rechargeable battery device. Uh, and I give myself a two minute stimulation of energy. In many cases that will uh, significantly reduce the discomfort associated with the headache. And in some cases it will completely abort the headache. Because this is electrical energy, it's not a pharmaceutical. If that first two minute dose doesn't give you the relief that you're looking for, you can give yourself a second and a third dose. Uh, according to the FDA, we can go up to 30 doses per day for as many days as a patient would like to. So that's acute treatment. In prevention, it's a little bit of a different protocol. And the idea is that we, we have a protocol that says, use this device two or three times a day. Again, a two minute stimulation, think morning and evening. And if you do that consistently over say a 30 day or a 45 day period, and then you look back, our pivotal data says uh, that there is a statistically significant reduction in the number of headache days over that period of time where you're consistently giving yourself a prophylactic dose. So that's what we do today. In Europe, under the CE mark, we actually have broader indications into things like asthma and, uh, and depression, uh, but in the US, we are limited to headache for the time being. You know, one of the things that, that I was thinking about while you're responding was, um, what's, what's the side effect profile and, and the safety profile of, of that? Because you said that you could use it many times is there any association of, of side effects with, with additional use? Uh, and you also said there was a limit to how many times it could be used uh, by the FDA. They, they imposed a limit. Yep. So what, what are the side effects of it and, and what should we be concerned about on that, on that front? Excellent question. Unlike the, the various uh, high powered pharmaceuticals that are available for headache, uh, this electrical energy has no known drug and drug interactions, and it can be safely used adjunctively with all of the other uh, over the counter or prescription medications uh, that are available for treating headache. Uh, um, specifically, side effects, improvements, I'm not sure you would call those uh, side effects. Uh, there have been, uh, because this is, we are delivering electrical energy through the skin, uh, there have been reports of local skin irritation. Uh, this device is contraindicated for use if you have metal in your spine, for example, if you've had um, fusion surgery uh, and you've got uh, metal uh, implants or screws in your spine uh, close to the, the treatment site, then that's something that uh, would be contraindicated. Um, as far as the dose limits, on, you know, going back to the history of vagus nerve stimulation, the implanted devices are programmed to deliver up to four doses per hour. So we have a body of literature from the implanted devices that say that you really can't overstimulate the vagus nerve. In our device, uh, the limit of 30 per day was set by the FDA because that's the, uh, that's the clinical data that we provided to them was up to 30 stimulations per day. There's reason to believe that there's no limit, but as a practical matter, 30 doses per day, uh, you'd be busy giving yourself a stimulation every hour or so. And that's not really sure. necessary. And then, and then how does that compare to other treatments for headache? I mean, uh, you know, we, there's the tryptin group, which is generally used and there's some other mm -hmm. approaches as well that are probably less convenient. I mean, I'm thinking of the oxygen therapy. Uh, what are some of those other treatments out there that are available uh, and what are their shortcomings relative to, to gamma core? Excellent question. So for in migraine, the vast majority of migraine patients are treating themselves um, either with diet and exercise and lifestyle or with over-the-counter med medications. Um, roughly 5 million migraine patients are under the care, are seeing a physician uh, for their headache pain. Roughly 2 million migraine patients prescription therapy or a class of drugs called tryptan, uh, relatively easy to obtain. And, you know, if you look at the literature, you'll see a, a variety of issues around patient satisfaction 
using triptans um, either because of the side effect profile or just because it makes them drowsy or, or uncomfortable. Uh, beyond triptans, there are a variety of injectable medications. Botox for migraine has been available for almost 10 years now. And there's a newer class of CGRP antibodies, uh, which have been commercialized over the last two to three years uh, that are still relatively expensive. We try to position gamma core therapy as that sort of second or third line therapy in migraine in competition with the injectables of Botox and CGRP antagonists. Um, in cluster headache, which is a much smaller indication, about 400,000 patients in the United States, a much more debilitating form of headache. Uh, people talk about it as the suicide headache. Um, there are papers uh, most recently in last summer in Cephalagia, which is one of the Neurological Society um, uh, publications, that talk about using gamma core as first line therapy for cluster headache because there really are no um, cost effective FDA cleared pharmaceutical therapies, effective pharmaceutical therapies for cluster headache. So that's an area that, uh, that we are focusing on, but again, it's a much smaller demographic. So uh, we have to be very targeted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's move on IP. Uh, you've got, got an impressive list of patents. I, I think I counted over 40 different indications where, where you filed IP. Mm -hmm. uh, migraine and cluster headache appear to be only the beginning. Yes, uh, here. absolutely. Uh, and there are several studies being done now on new indications. Uh, let me just list off a few. There's post-surgery ileus, brain injury and stroke vist victims, uh, COVID, PTSD, post-traumatic headache, gastroparesis, and maybe, maybe a, a, another one that I missed. Um, what, what seems to be the most exciting of these studies that are going on? Uh, and are there any more on the horizon? So absolutely, yes. So um, first on, on intellectual property, uh, you know, we believe that we have very profound protection around non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. As I mentioned, the technology for implanted vagus nerve stimulation has been around for quite a while. Our IP is around non-invasively stimulating the vagus nerve stimulate the vagus nerve, excuse me. And, and we're pretty comfortable that we've got very broad protection uh, for a transdermal delivery of, of this inner energy. As far as our uh, activities uh, to extend the indications, you know, as I think I mentioned in, in Europe under the CE mark, uh, we have a broader list of indications. Um, we've got a, a strong and growing business uh, within the federal supply service. So that's the uh, Veterans Administration hospitals, that's the uh, Department of Defense military treatment facilities, it's Indian Health Services. And so we have a lot of champions within, especially the, the VA service. And, and because of that relationship, we're getting pulled from primary headache, migraine and cluster, into secondary headache. So um, uh, headache associated with traumatic brain injury, so concussion, basically. And uh, there are various trials ongoing uh, in, uh, in the VA system or financed by DOD, uh, looking at the clinical effectiveness of our therapy um, in concussion. Beyond that, uh, especially in collaboration with Dr. Bremner down in, at the Atlanta VA, uh, there's a large trial getting kicked off in post-traumatic stress disorder. So, our partnership with, uh, with DOD, DARPA, uh, is going to pull us into concussion and into PTSD. And we aren't going, we're not spending a lot of money to do that. We're putting a lot of effort into it, but DARPA is financing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's and one of the points that I like to make is that your R&D is being funded by others, which is great. I mean, they, they do the Absolutely. work. And, and if, it, if it turns out, then you guys are, are going to be able to, to, to sell into that market. Absolutely. And then and in the, at the same time or in, in parallel, there are various um, European um, agencies that have been very interested in taking vagus nerve stimulation um, uh, efferently, sort of down into the, into the core uh, of the body. And, and you mentioned the, the trial that uh, Dr. Chapman published a few months ago about using gamma core therapy uh, in the treatment of post-operative ileus. Um, if you've ever had day surgery, uh, 
or if you've ever had uh, procedures with anesthesia, you know that uh, they, they really want you to, um, to pass gas uh, or have some flatulence before they're going to let you get up and, and leave the clinic. And so that's, that's ilius. That's, that's making sure that the digestive system is awake mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. surgery. And so that, that he's working towards, and this is being funded by um, agencies in the EU, uh, looking at using gamma core therapy, frankly, to get people out of the hospital more quickly post surgery. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. more exciting than that, uh, we announced the completion of enrollment in a trial in Turkey, looking at acute treatment of stroke. And the idea being that using gamma core therapy acutely uh, can reduce the rate of growth of, uh, of the infarct. And that's, that's very fascinating work and, um, and could be very exciting. Uh, we'll know soon because that trial has completed enrollment and they're, they're processing the data right now. So vagus nerve stimulation as a broad platform, you know, the implantable devices are on label for epilepsy and for depression. Uh, mm -hmm. There's every reason to believe that gamma core therapy would be useful in those indications as well. Uh, but uh, that's further down the development path for us. Sure. So, and, and, you know, I should mention that there's a lot of research out there, not, not associated with you, but just talking about how the, uh, the vagus nerve impacts all of these, all of these things like ileus and the gastrointestinal system and all that. It's fascinating uh, mm -hmm. work that's been done, uh, you know, some of it's decades old, but it's not, it's not like this isn't known. Um, you know, I think, I think we've known for a while that there's that, that relationship between the vagus nerve and, and, and all You're these bodily processes. Right. So it's, 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 it's just astounding, uh, not astounding, but just, it's great that, you know, you're finding, finding this out and, and, and actually leveraging that to, to, um, to help people. Yep. Um, and you know, and we because, also saw another article. Because of that, that, John, the, the investigators and the granting authorities um, are motivated to do this. So we don't have to spend a tremendous amount of money on R&D. Right. So we're really right. leveraging that legacy of, of, uh, of data. You know, one more thing that, uh, that I almost forgot to mention, but we just published, um, uh, we did a press release about a study in Parkinson's disease as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, where the researchers are finding, um, you know, tremendous benefit from using gamma core therapy in, in some of the motor function associated with Parkinson's disease. Yeah, so the results of from that were pretty, were pretty good, actually. I very mean, exciting. Pretty, small, pretty you know, small data set, yeah. and there's a follow-on trial with a much larger data set being funded by the uh, British government, but very exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, when, one thing I wanted to just touch on just shortly was uh, the HCPCS code. I mean, that yes, seems sir. like a small thing, but it actually has pretty big implications, especially in one of, one of your areas of focus, which is commercial payers. Um, can Absolutely. You, can you explain why that's so important to Electricor that you receive this code, which differentiates you from, I think, what was it, transcutaneous? I forget the, the name of it, how you were classified and, before, but yeah. tell, tell us about muscle that. Muscle stimulators. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that up. You know, um, in the U.S. healthcare system, there are several gates, right? The FDA uh, validates the safety and efficacy of devices. But that doesn't mean that insurance companies are going to pay for it. And so from our first indication in, in the time of our first indication in 2018 um, until most recently, uh, when a physician prescribed gamma core therapy um, and applied for insurance reimbursement, they would have to use a miscellaneous code. And for an insurance company, as soon as they see a miscellaneous code, oh, that must be experimental. We're not going to pay for it. So took us 18 months um, of working with uh, CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Uh, and in April, we were awarded a unique reimbursement code, a, 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 HCPC, a HCPCS code. We call them HCPCS codes. So that code became effective in April. And so now we are finally, the doors open for us to work with uh, the various uh, regional and national uh, commercial insurance companies to say, here's our unique code. You're no longer going to go through a miscellaneous code. Let's go negotiate a fee schedule specific to our unique code. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that activity started in April. It never has given us a positive coverage determination. Uh, we're working on many more and, and 
you're not going to see that revenue lift this year. This year is going to be all about negotiations with the insurance companies. But as we increase that universe of positive benefit uh, determinations, uh, you'll see our revenue start to pick up from that insurance reimbursed component in 2022 and beyond. Okay, great. Well, um, now I wanted to move on to kind of the area that most interests us here that are modeling the, the revenue forecast. Uh, you guys have got plenty of irons mm-hmm. in the fire and this is why I think we like you so much. There's so many different things. There's the VA, there's the NHS, we've got commercial payers, we've got all of these uh, uh, um, relationships that you sign with, with uh, international distributors. Um, so let's just start out with um, those four main areas. I don't want to lose everybody because there really are a lot. Um, you know, the VA, they're your biggest client. That's, that's the number one, uh, the number one uh, revenue source right now, although it may not be in the future. Um, tell us what you think about that. Um, but how did this relationship start and, and right. why are the patients uh, benefiting from GammaCore? Yeah, so that so in um, in 2018 and became effective the beginning of 2019, uh, we negotiated a contract with the Federal Supply Service that gives us access to uh, the VA hospitals, military treatment facilities, Indian Health Services, and if you are a patient um, in the VA system, gamma core therapy is free to the patients. So a headache patient uh, goes to the VA hospital, gets a prescription. Um, we ship the therapy directly to the patient and we get paid by the VA hospital. It's a very, uh, a very simple business model, very effective. Um, and because of all of the obstacles in, uh, in getting insurance reimbursement, uh, many early stage medical device companies start out with a federal supply service contract for all of mm-hmm. those reasons. Uh, and right now we are active in about 30 VA hospitals. There are more than 300 VA hospitals around the country. Obviously we're focused on the ones that have larger um, headache practices, uh, but we still have a lot of room for growth uh, within the VAs. Yeah, definitely. Um, And then another area of growth is the, the National Health Service in the UK. I think this is your number two area. And you've got relationships with NHS Scotland, NHS England. And I think weren't you working on something in Wales too, I, I believe, but you can tell us about that. What's the opportunity here and yep. why does the NHS like GammaCore? Yeah, so, so um, similar to what we did in the VA system, uh, we set up a small uh, direct organization in the United Kingdom early on. And uh, since 2019, Gamma Core Therapy started off uh, being reimbursed by NHS through their ITP program, Innovation Technology Program. And under that program, again, Gamma Core Therapy is free to the patient and was reimbursed, but the Innovation Technology Program had a very limited budget, right? It was purposely developed uh, to seed new therapies that became available in the United Kingdom. in uh, January of 2020, uh, the NICE, which is the UK version of, of uh, CMS in the United States, uh, they came up with a policy determination that said, not only will you get a clinical benefit from gamma core therapy, but if you use gamma core therapy in cluster headache patients, you're going to save the healthcare system on average 450 British pounds per patient per year uh, mm-hmm. in avoided medical system costs. So not even talking about lost time at work uh, and life's um, uh, quality of life, just specifically avoided expenses within the healthcare system. And so based on that determination uh, in uh, earlier, the first part of this year, uh, NHS England expanded coverage into what they call the MedTech funding mandate, which dramatically increases the number of prescribers within the United Kingdom uh, have access to this there in parallel as well. Based on that success in the United Kingdom, uh, which has um, you know basically national health care, we've got increasing interest from many other geographies around the world. And so that has led to, uh, to the various distributor announcements that we've been able to make over the first half of this year. And, and we've got a funnel of additional distributors in other parts of the world, other countries within Europe, in the Middle East, and in Asia, and uh, and eventually into Latin America as well. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the things we've been most impressed with is, is these distribution agreements because they're relatively low capital intensity uh, and, and it gives you broad, um, broad exposure throughout the globe. How, how are these structured um, and what should we expect with them? And then you also said, you know, we might expect a few more in the future. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so, so in general, uh, these are structured as uh, uh, straight up distribution agreements. Uh, we sell... Uh, we sell the product to the distributor at a transfer price and our distribution partner in that country is responsible for uh, whatever registrations and regulatory clearances are required in that territory. And then they, of course, they're responsible for all of the sales and marketing costs. We support them both with clinical data and, uh, and technical support. Uh, but the vast majority of the risk uh, is on the distribution partner. So it's incremental revenue for us. It's at a, uh, a lower margin because it's a transfer price, uh, but we don't have the overhead uh, investment on uh, registrations, uh, local approvals and sales and marketing. And so yeah. uh, it's very nice ancillary revenue for us, uh, which just will contribute to our growth somewhat in this year, but really, again, we're setting the foundation uh, for accelerating revenue growth into 2022 and beyond. Okay. Any, any other major geographical areas that you think might, uh, might uh, be Several. future partners? Several. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll see that when it comes out. Um, yeah, confident. yeah, yeah. No, no. It's exciting to, to see where, where it is. Like, we could probably guess if we looked at the map too, yes, uh, where can. some of those uh, attractive areas might be. Um, so the last major area that, that you're pursuing is U.S. commercial, and it, it seems like it could be the largest opportunity, you know, given the number of lives um, yes. that are covered by commercial payers. And, you know, what you brought up before, the information about how the NHS, you know, saw cost savings. I mean, that's something that should translate from, you know, from over there to over here. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure U.S. payers would uh, would also recognize that value. Um, what, what are the opportunities here in the, in the U.S. and what have been some of the um, impediments, I guess, to to faster growth there uh, so far. Yeah, and so we, you, you, know, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, right? We have about 12 million covered lives right now through um, uh, Caremark and, uh, and Express Scripts. Uh, that's, um, while it's a lot of covered lives, it's, it's still a very small percentage. And so it's still not an efficient call point for us. The, the code that dramatically streamlines the, the new HICPICS code, K1020, dramatically streamlines the back office, right? When, when, a, when, a, when a physician prescribes a therapy, now they, they, they put our specific code um, and, that, and, and that gets recognized by the insurance companies. Uh, but the primary issue is the one you just mentioned, right? Not only do we have to show clinical benefit, but we have to show healthcare economics. Uh, the, the data that's coming from the United Kingdom is very compelling. Uh, we have a similar large and growing database of success within the VA system within the United States. And uh, we're constantly updating uh, that sort of healthcare economics dossier that we discuss with the commercial payers. Um, and it's a process and uh, it's, I'm a broken record on this. It always takes longer uh, than I think it should, uh, but we're very optimistic about uh, getting some more of those insurance company wins over the second half of this year. Okay, great. Well, you know, we always say that every every biotech company it always takes longer than you think. That's one of our one of our principal investment <laughs> pillars. <laughs> um, uh, we're we're coming to the close here. I don't want to go on too long, um, but uh, did want to talk a bit about just the the characteristics, financial characteristics. So, Electricor has minimal debt, market cap of under 100 million, growing top line at over 60 percent. Uh, numerous irons in the fire that can help accelerate growth. Uh, what else uh, should investors know about the financial profile and, and what's your cash position? Yeah, so most importantly, the ticker is ECOR. Right? I want to make sure that investors. I want to forget that. We'll have that in the. We'll, we'll have that below. That. The, 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 um, the, the capital capitalization tab table is very clean. It's all straight common. There are a few uh, warrants, um, but unfortunately, those are out of the money and, and likely to expire. Um, on exercise. So it's a, it's a very clean structure. Um, there's really no debt. Uh, the PPP loan, uh, I'm not sure if we've announced it yet, but the PP loan, the PPP loan that we took um, has been forgiven. Uh, so that slug of debt is going to come off of the balance sheet. 
At March 31st, we had $25.5 million of cash. Uh, we've been burning roughly $4 million per quarter. Uh, we are keeping a tight lid on operating expenses. And so as revenues continue to increase, that burn per quarter is going to continue to decrease. And so we feel very comfortable that with a cash balance of $25.5 million, uh, we've got a very healthy runway uh, into and through uh, 2022. And we're knocking on the door of getting to, uh, uh, to cash flow positive. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That's that's what we have in our model. Well, and you know, if, if investors want to see what our thoughts are in terms of the, that financial trajectory, um, please access our research. And you know, Dan, thank you for speaking with us today. As I said, Electricor is one of our our best ideas, uh, given the strong revenue growth and all of the different uh, catalysts that you have that that will push revenues uh, in the future. Uh, and over the longer term, we think that uh, GammaCore could not only just treat headache, but a lot of other things as well, which we talked about here today. Um, do you want to have any, um, do you have any closing comments before we sign off? You know, greatly appreciate the opportunity and, and we're big fans of Zach's. You guys do a tremendous job of, of in-depth research and, and, and separating out the, uh, the, the smoke from the fire. So we really appreciate your support and look forward to working with you in the future. All right. Well, thank you, Dan. And um, you can find links to uh, Zach's, research on electric core uh, in the summary below. And it's also at ser.zax.com. And uh, I think that's it. Uh, and if you also want to follow us on Twitter, where you can find um, updates uh, on, on, on real-time news for electric core and other companies, it's at van john one zero again at Twitter at van john one zero. And uh, thank you again, Dan. We appreciate your time very much. And we'll speak with you again soon. All right. Bye everybody.